This video is part of a series of videos that I'm making to help new users to Linux, in particular if you're working from the command line. Note that while I'm using Linux here, uh, most if not all of these uh, tools are also available on macOS. So I'm going to discuss these eight things, and there's several commands for some of these. Um, locate and find I use on a weekly basis, or at least locate I do and, and often find. Some of the others I don't use as often, but I think everybody should know these basic ideas. So for locate, my distribution of Linux, which is OpenSUSE, does not have the locate command automatically installed. So I had to install the mlocate package. Okay. Now, depending on what distribution of Linux you use, you'll have a different package manager. So look at that and figure out how you would actually install this. Once you install it, it should configure itself such that it rebuilds an index of the files on your computer every day. Not the contents of the files, but the file names. So I may know that I'm looking for a file that has the extension CSV. And let's do this. So I would type like locate CSV. And we get this right here. Now notice this has .csv in uppercase. Here's CSV as part of a file name. This is CSV as part of a file name. Here's the extension CSV and CSV. So I may just be looking for the actual extensions .csv, so I need to put a period in there. And now it trimmed out the two that just have CSV somewhere in the name. This of course is an uppercase, but most of the time I use lowercase CSV. But this right here is case sensitive. So if I will make it case insensitive, I put dash I in there, which is how I typically use it. And now you can see there's lots of CSV files. We can see how many by piping it to the word count command. So WC-L to count the lines. And it says that there's 2,116 lines, which means that many files with that extension right there. Now if we go back and look at what I had a moment ago, We well, says it has these three files. But if we look in this directory, which is right here where other videos over here, that file is not there. So what I had done earlier today was I created this file, then I rebuilt the database, and then I deleted this file. But it, since the database hasn't been rebuilt, it doesn't know this file doesn't exist anymore. So what I can do is that when I run it, I put the dash E option there, and then it checks for each of those files to see if it still exists. And you can see this is not in the listing. So that's helpful. If you know what a regular expression is, we can use those as well. I made a video recently in which I discussed regular expressions, uh, in particular with regard to using Vim. But we can use those ideas here as well. So I can do this, dash dash reg x. And I can give it a pattern that I'm looking for. So what is this doing? It says, look for files or patterns that contain .txt in lowercase and .csv, or excuse me, or one of those two. And that's what the vertical bar means. This or this. Now, why is the backslash there? Well, I'm escaping the period because the period in a regular expression typically refer or refers to um, or represents, excuse me, uh, any character. Well, I'm not looking for any character. Like if I had a file name that was ATXT, I wouldn't want to match that. I'm looking specifically for the period. And by escaping it, it says, oh, treat the period as just a period. So if I do that, I get this right here. And we can count that. And we see there's over 9,800 matches. So those are the ways or some of the ways that I use the locate command. Now there's other times that if I know where to start looking, I can use the find command. So if we go into say this directory, I'm gonna do something first. So I had built the structure earlier and I've modified it since then, but we wanna start with the fresh one. So these files are in this directory. It has a couple of subdirectories. They also have files. 
I'm typing log, but that won't mean anything on your computer because it's an alias on my computer. So whenever I type log, it really just does ls space dash h-o-g-t-r capital G. So I'm, I'm going to type log d1. Oh, excuse me. There's those files. D2, there's those files. And let me go ahead and change one of these while we're here. I'm going to do this. Uh, Putting that inside one of the files. Let's see. Right? So I can do things like this. Find if I know the directory, the starting point, I can say do this, say D1 and say look at all the files within that so type is f for file and it shows those files right there if i said type d it would show me directories but the only thing it finds in this path is just d1 itself and i can do the same thing for d2 if i want to start where i'm currently at i'll instead just use the period and now i do it you can see it finds the directories d1 and d2 which are in as part subdirectories of where i'm at I can look for the files, and there they are. Now, lots of times, I'm looking for something a particular name, so I could do this, find dot dash name, say star dot htm. It found one match. Well, if I want to make it case insensitive, because right now it's looking specifically for lowercase htm, well, I can use the i to ignore case, and you find there's two matches. If I think that there might be some files that either have HTML or HTML, I then could put a star here to wildcard it, and it turns out there are. All of these have .htm as part of the file name. Now, lots of times when I find a file, I want to do something to the file. So one of the things you notice here, um, let's go back to look at this, is these file permissions. This is a text file, that's a text file. CSV files are in the text format. HTML is really a text format. So really I would want the file permissions to be readable and writable for me, readable for people in my group, and readable for everybody else. Let's do a long listing to see more. And you can see this file right here has read, write, and executable permissions for me, readable and executable permissions for everybody in the users group, and readable and executable for everybody else. At home, I have a Linux computer and I have a Windows computer. And so sometimes I back up uh, files from my Linux computer onto an external drive, and then I want to be able to access those from my Windows computer. To do that, I need a file format that Windows recognizes, and so I use NTFS. The problem with that is though, it doesn't maintain Linux file permissions. So when I copy Linux files to that hard drive and then copy them back, I get something like this. So I may want to change those. Now I can use change mod individually and type 644file.txt. And we see that did what I wanted, but maybe I want to do that to all of the files, including the subdirectories. Before we do that though, let's talk about what does this mean? Well, it turns out this number right here is in base eight. I want to have readable, writable for me, but not executable. And then I will have readable for everybody else and readable for everybody in the users group. So what I really want in terms of a bit pattern is I want readable, writable, but not executable for me, readable for people in my group, but not writable or executable, and readable for everybody else and not writable, not executable. Well, this right here is binary for six, and that's binary for four. So that's what that is, okay? So now let's uh, change all those. So I can find things, so I'll do find dot dash I name, say star dot htm, or excuse me, CS, uh, txt, we'll do that one first. And now when I find one, I wanna apply change mod to it. So I do dash exec, that's part of find, 
and then you use the command you want to apply to it. Change mod 644, and then in place of the file name, like I had here, I'm going to use the curly brackets, and then I need to terminate the line. So I'll do that right there. Did it work? Yeah, there's the other text file got changed. And if we look at, say, the D1 directory, we see I changed the text files. Now that I know that works, I can also do it for the CSV files as well as the HTML files or HTM. And I'll put the star there, you know. So log D1, log D2. So I've changed all of them. And I've had to apply this to probably hundreds of files, if not thousands, by copying the entire directory structures back over from my external drive. Now, another thing I sometimes do is I want to search files. I may, I may know the string within the file, but I can't remember where it's at or its file name. So we can use this again. So let's look for the TXT files. And when you find one, apply grep to it. Grep stands for Global Regular Expression Parser, so I can give it a pattern I'm looking for, which in this case happens to be the word string. But it could be, this could be a regular expression if I had one to try to match it. So I'm going to use this right here. And it found those two matches. Now, it's nice that it found those matches, but I don't know what files those are in. So I'm going to change it to this. And it says, this is an F4, this is an F1 in this directory. Let's look at one more example. Sometimes I need to find a file that was created in a certain time period. So let's do a long listing again from D1. If you look, you can see these four files were all created today, which is February 8th, but this, is, this was created five days ago. And so likewise for D2, we look and see, oh, these are all created today. So I can do find dot dash M time five for five days. If I know that it, this only works if it's exactly five days and it found that. If I didn't know, I can narrow it down. I might say, well, I know it's greater than three days, so it could be four, but it's, uh, say less than nine days. Well, that still found it since five is in this range. So this is more than three, less than nine. So that's another way I use it. If you go to my webpage, which is Brazil University, okay, or the webpage itself is brazil.com, here's a bunch of examples. And I think I probably collected these. Notice here I first created this in the year 2000, so it's been a while. But I think these are all things I really had to do, and I just saved them into this file so that way I could execute it uh, or view it online. So you can look at that on your own time if you're interested. Now, sometimes when I'm doing something, my computer will seem to get bogged down, and I want to see what's happening. I want to see, is a processor going crazy? Is uh, Am I using up too much memory? And so for that, I'll use the top command. And top should already be installed. And find will already be installed in your computer. This defaults to sorting by percent CPU usage. And you see the thing at the top here is OBS. That's the program that I'm using to make this video. So it's, I have it configured to use a lot of CPU power because I'm not worried about it. But if that was a problem, this would be how I would see it. If I want to sort by memory usage, which is at high here, I need to use capital M. So I'm going to press Shift M. And you see Firefox is using 15% of the memory. You can look over here and see I have close to 8 gigs of RAM, 2 gigabyte swap file. So it's really more like 10 gigs in terms of total space. I can go back to CPU power sorting. So it's capital P, so I'm going to use Shift P to get there. Now, what if I need to get rid of something? Well, let's say I do this. Now, this is this is fine. Well, before we do that, let me show you a couple more things for this. Uh, here's showing the user as Brazil or root because I'm using my home computer. But what if you're at work and you're one of 10 people who use the same computer? Well, it might be helpful, helpful excuse me, to say just show user Brazil if that's who you are. And now it's just my stuff. And now I use Q to quit. Now, let's say I have a runaway process. Um, so let's look at this program. So here's a C program I wrote earlier. And the intent here is that I'm going to sum the integers 
say from one to nine in steps of one, right, because they're integers, but I made a mistake. I left out this line, right? So by not having this line, that means that I never changes. So I will always be less than this. And therefore, the loop runs forever. So if we save this, I compile it. That's also a alias that I have because I want to treat it as C. And so I created the a.out program. So I run it and it gets stuck. Now I can kill it by pressing control C in this case, but sometimes you have uh, applications that are running and you can't kill them directly like that. Maybe it's a GUI or something else and it just seems to run forever. So what do I do about that? Well, one of the things I can do is I can use the PS command to also look at processes. So I'm gonna do AUX to see everything. And you can see it really is everything. So I'm gonna pop that to grep and look for a dot out. And it shows two matches. One is the command that I ran right here with grep, right? That I'm looking for a dot out. That's not the one I want. I want the one that's actually the executable. So here's the process for that. I can tell that because if I instead I, I pass this to head by using the pipe command, I get the top 10 lines. It says, oh, this is the user column. Here's the process ID column. So let's do that again. And we see the process I want to kill is 32307. Now, another way of finding that out would be to type PIDOF, A dot out, and we see it's the same. If I did this, you see there's lots of Firefox processes, so it doesn't always help narrow things down. But I know what this is what I want, so I'm going to type kill 32307. Now, you want to be really sure this is what you want because if you kill the wrong process, you might kill, say, your graphical environment, and now you're kind of out of luck. So I do that and watch it over here. I killed it. Now that sends a message that it wants it to, to stop, but sometimes even that's not enough. So even though this process isn't available anymore, so this won't work, but sometimes you have to force the issue and use dash nine to get really hardcore. Okay. Now I showed you top, but if you have uh, a computer that you can install things on, you may want to use a newer uh, application that does sort of the same thing. And I'm gonna show you HTOP. Now HTOP will also let me get limited to user, a particular user if I want, but let's just see what it looks like without it. Notice it's quite different. It uses a library called incurses. Incurses allows people to create a fake graphical environment. This is not truly a graphical uh, interface, right? Like your desktop or Firefox, you know, this is truly a graphical application. This is a text-based application that looks sort of like a graphical application, and it's done using incurses. Now, my computer, I think, has six cores on my processor, so these are the one, two, three, four, five, six cores. Once again, it shows that I'm using uh, a certain amount of memory. I have a certain swap. This makes it a little easier to use, so I can do things like this. I can sort by memory. I can invert that, and it's got these uh, processes with child processes. I can change the display on that by doing F5 here. You see quite a bit more memory. I can change back to CPU. There's OBS again, sort of that way, sort of that way. You see OBS is usually quite a bit of work. Now let's run our program again. And now I'm gonna do uh, search so f3 oops I'm in the wrong window maybe over here f3 I'm looking for a dot out it found something so I'm gonna hit enter to say yeah that's what I want and now I'm gonna kill it by using f9 and here's where it's prompting me to make sure that's what I want so I'm gonna hit enter to say yeah that's really what I want and it killed that application and you can do other things you can reconfigure or look at the setup and I'm gonna hit Q to quit, but this is something you might be interested in. Now, when I run applications, lots of times, like if I wanna run VLC, which is my media player, I would put it in the background 
using the ampersand. And that will allow it to, not supposed to be full screen, but what I was trying to do, but what it does is it runs it, but if I come over here, if I hit enter, you can see actually I got back to the prompt. So I can continue to work in this shell if I wanted to. But sometimes I forget to do that. So occasionally I'll do this. I forget to put the ampersand. And now it's running, but if I come over here and hit enter, it won't let me do anything. I, I mean, I can tie it, but it's not, this won't execute until this stops. So what I want to do is this. I'm going to press control in the other window, control Z. So over here, control Z stopped it, but didn't kill it. And now I'm going to try BG to put it in the background. And notice here, it tells me it was the equivalent of having ran it like that. So now I can come over here and do you know, LS or whatever. So that's occasionally helpful. Now the last two things have to do with disk space. A couple months ago, I had a hard drive failure and had to replace my hard drive, but I made the mistake of not buying a much larger hard drive. So I'm always checking hard drive space. So I can do something like this, DF, and it shows me some stuff. In a moment, we'll see how to make this easier to read. DF-H will give me a human readable form. But I don't have multiple hard drives, so this is not all that helpful. But basically what it's telling me is that I have different partitions on this drive, like boot has its own partition, and so it's allocated you know, 511 megabytes, and I can't really use that for anything else. Home, my home directory is on this partition, which has 1.8 terabytes. Now this 1.8, is if you count blocks as 1,024 bytes or 10 to, or excuse me, two to the 10th power. If you want to see it in blocks of 1,000, assuming that's what it was, you can use capital H. And see now it claims it's two terabytes. Now typically what I actually do is I put the dot here and just look at this. It says, oh, I'm using 86% of this hard drive and I only have 256 gigabytes left. So pretty soon, I'm going to have to start making some tough calls. How do I know how, how I'm allocating that 1.5 terabytes? Well, I can use the du command. So let's go up a directory. Let me see what's here. So type du. It shows me that, which isn't that helpful. I'm going to type du-sh uh, to summarize it and make it human readable. See right there, and I'm going to add star. And you see it shows me the files in this directory plus these videos and stuff like that. Now, I also can do this, dash A, and get that right there. So in human readable form, I can see things like, this is a 662 megabyte file. You got these directories that aren't that big because the files in those directories aren't that big. All right, let's look at this, see where we're at. Let's go up a level. Now let's run it again. Now it's a little more helpful because I have these directories. This is a directory that's 4.2 gigabytes. Um, that's a directory that's 44 gigabytes and so forth. Just like before, this, this du is a command that you should already have on your computer. But if you can install things, then you may want to use the end curses version, which is nc du. And notice it gives me a fake graphical environment. Now I can navigate down using the down arrow, up arrow. If I want to go into a directory, I can use the right arrow. Left goes back up a level to where you came from. But I discovered earlier by accident, it also supports Vim keystrokes. So in the Vim editor, if you want to move up, you type K, going down is J, to the left is H, and to the right is L. These letters right here. Well, this allows me to do those same letters, which is nice. So I can go into this directory. So L, and we'll go in this directory, L, this directory, L. And you see the sizes. So going back up a level, I used H, H. So you can see that's 121 megabytes. Uh, that's 7.4 gigabytes for this whole directory. 
And I think what this is showing me, I'm somewhat new to this tool. I think what it's basically showing me is, is in terms of, you know, it shows from, from where I'm at, I'm using 113 gigabytes starting in the directory I'm in, not my entire hard drive. And this is kind of giving you a, a, an idea of how much of that 113, say this directory uses. 44, 43 out of this would be about a third. So this is using a large percentage. This is using a large percentage. These others, not as much. But that certainly is nice to use because I've had to sort of manually, using DU, I've had to sort of manually figure some things out or add things up myself. So this is nice to have. Like I said, you can move around. So there's some tools that, while not uh, mind-blowing, I think everybody who's doing to work from the, on their own Linux computer, and especially if they work from the command line, should learn how to use.